Amen. So this morning, brothers and sisters, I have the privilege of reading to you a couple portions of Scripture. <coughs> the first one is going to be from Hosea 6. It'll be verses 1 through 11, which is on page 892 in our pew Bibles. And the second portion will be from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, which is on page 1005 in our pew Bibles. If you can stand for the reading of God's Word. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. As at Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me. Gilead is a city of evildoers, stained with the footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for the victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. I have seen a horrible thing in Israel. There Ephraim is given the prostitution. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Notice that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one. And there is no other but him. To love him with all of your heart. With all your understanding and with all your strength. And to love your neighbors yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. <coughs> when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to them, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And then from no one, then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen and amen. Um, so you know, <clears throat> excuse me, we're continuing within the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. Um, Article 22 is this week, worship in the Sabbath day and to work our way through these articles and through um, the 
Word of God. These uh, articles are a reflection of the truth of the Word of God, and this is uh, a doctrinal statement that um, our church basically adheres to and accepts, and um, when we're all done with this, that will probably that will likely become an official stance of the church. So, uh, amen to that. It's been a joy going through this this morning. Um, the title is of the central idea is genuine love for the one true God is the essence of worship. And the title is what's the title? What is the essence of genuine worship of God? I was thinking when I was standing, seeing over there. You know, could have entitled it, Beware of Being a Fickle, Beware of Fickle Christianity. But I like this, what is the essence of genuine worship of God? And in the verses in Hosea 6, 1 through 6 in particular, and in other verses that we're going to look at, we're going to see that because genuine love for the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, reflected in our loving our neighbor as ourself, we see an awareness of our need to return to the Lord. This is from Hosea. There's an admonition having an appetite to acknowledge or know the Lord and an admonition of faithfulness to the Lord. So Lord, thank you. What a glorious, glorious message, word you have for us uh, this morning as it relates to what is the essence of genuine worship. Help us to hear it, heed it, fall in love with it, and fall deeper in love with you because of it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I've said to you before, I love Tuesdays. Uh, when I come here Tuesday in the morning, that's the day that I get to start looking at, okay, what is the message? What is the word? We know we're going through this confession, and I, I've probably read the article that we're on before Tuesday, but Tuesday I sit there and had the privilege, it's my second favorite day of the week, maybe, if I can overstate that, I don't think so, but maybe the second favorite day of the week, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and I'm like, what? I'm like, how, how do we look at one passage, how do we look at one thought <clears throat> as it relates to what is worship? And, and we got the verses in, the, in there from the article about the Sabbath day and I'll touch on that. We've talked about we talked about that periodically. And it's like what one verse, what one thought. And Brother John and I sometimes, you know, talk during we talk during the week about this. It's like, where are we going to start from? What's the jump off point? And I don't even think Hosea 6, 1 through 6 is in the article per se. I don't remember. It may or may not be. But in looking at the article and reading the principles, I'm like, what is the one, what's the central place where we're going to start? And I that led to Hosea 6, 1 through 6, trying to think about it and define, and think about what is the essence of genuine worship of God. And so, because genuine worship, genuine love for God is the essence of true worship, in Hosea 6 we see an awareness of God's people's need to return to the Lord. Hosea 6, verse 1, says, Come! And that's the admonition of the Christian life. That's a call of God continually to the life of the child of God. Come. Come to me. Draw near to me. It starts with, come to me, sinner. Turn to me in repentance and faith to be saved. You're a sinner. You're in need of Christ. You need salvation, forgiveness of sin. Come. And then the whole Christian life really could be boiled down to that word, come. Come. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they didn't come. At first, they ran and they hid and they were in shame and and then they're blaming each other. You know how that goes. They're blaming the serpent. They're blaming the woman. The woman's blaming the man. The man's blaming the woman. They're hiding. You ever been an underground Christian? <laughs> that would be another good title. If you were if you be, being a fugitive Christian, or you ever been an underground Christian? That's when there's sin, and then that's when there's conviction of sin. And there's a not a natural inclination to come and return to the Lord. There's a natural bent um, predisposition to run and flee, to hide, to 
get caught up in substitutes for the Lord to try to deaden your conscience. And, um, and God all the while says, come. There's, there's going to broken cisterns, as Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 2.13, uh, instead of coming to the living water to drink. Come, let us return to the Lord. Here in Hosea, the, true, the worship of the one true God was contaminated by Canaanite theology and practice, and yet they were disobedient. God was faithful to them, continually came to them, gave them the opportunity to repent, be restored in relationship with him, sent prophets, sent messengers. And that word come denotes movement. I guess the opposite of that coming is Jonah, going the opposite way from the direction that the Lord had wanted him uh, to go. And he certainly was underground. Uh, and so at peace in running from God that he falls asleep in the hole of the ship. So deadened to it, right? That's what could happen to us. So, that, so we need this awareness of our need to return to the Lord, all of us. All of us. Any moment, any time, um, any part of our day, throughout our day, dealing with the world and the flesh, the devil. Come. So there's an admonition here to his wayward children. And don't you love it? What would we be if it didn't say, Come, let us return to the Lord? He has torn. There's consequences. There's, there's the natural ravages of sin. And torn, you know, there's natural just things like despair, depression, and anxiety. This is just like at the top of the surface. There, there could be other ways that we're torn um, because of sin and disobedience to God. It says, but there is a promise. He will heal us spiritually. He'll heal us. He will bandage us. He's a God of compassion and grace and mercy. He's the God of the Good Samaritan. He sees us when we're in sin, and He sees us when we're running, and He sees us in our despair, or He sees us in our Martha moments, and He goes, calls us by name. Oh, wait a minute. Turn around. Look at that sight back there, quick. you got to turn around. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Look at that. <laughs> that is just too much. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I couldn't help it. That's precious. Amen. The baby. The little baby back there. She's all ears. All right. But he promises he'll heal us. We're been wounded, he will bandage us. He promises in verse 2, he will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. So our God, having an awareness of our need to return to the Lord is a blessing. He's not a God who's going to kick us to the curb. It says he will um, revive us. He stands ready to pardon. He stands ready to forgive. He stands ready to restore. He stands ready to give us fullness, abundance of life. Now, don't forget, the prophet Hosea, when it was written, how it was written, and, and a little bit about the life of, you know, about Hosea. It's in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. You talk about an illustration of God's mercy, grace, forgiveness, uh, an illustration of God's calling a child to come to him, uh, uh, an illustration of uh, God's forgiveness of his people. Imagine he tells Hosea, you know, go marry um, this prostitute as a symbol, as a picture of my love for my adulterous people. Imagine, he says, come to me, to, not the people that are like, yeah, they're, not, they're not so bad. Yeah. Adulterous. King James speaks about, uses that word, or speaks about the adulterous relationship, whoredom, whore, whoring. Whoring of people and whoring about Going after other gods, you might not. You know, we don't. Might not. We likely, very likely, I could say we're not bound down to a, a, a idol, like an image that we're worshiping. But worse than that, when we're in need of coming and returning to the Lord, we're bound down to the worship of ourselves in those moments. And so he says to his wayward people. 
come, and he gives the illustration of Hosea's life, Hosea 3, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. Oh, the other gods, oh, the raisin cakes that are out there, not just tempting the unsaved person, but the other gods and the raisin cakes and the things of the world and the flesh that, that we can worship. I love our dear sister used to marry, what's her name? I've used this before. She would give you the definition of idolatry and she said, idolatry. I am a doll. I love myself. God loves me. Even just the way I am, it's true, but God loves me, and so I'm a doll. I love myself. And yeah, we do worship ourselves. So I brought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of a barley. So there's the illustration. He will raise us up on the third day. He will revive us. Here to me, maybe Hosea 6, verse 3. I was just going to say, back in the day, but when I was a new believer, Hosea 6.3 would be a kind of remembering verse for me. And I'm like, yeah, okay, back in the day, it would be a remembering verse for you. 30, I don't know how many years ago that was. Now, how about today? This becoming a memory verse, this becoming a verse to meditate on and to chew on and to think about. See, you got to get the scriptures, we got to get the scriptures in our mind so that when I heard a pastor say, when the gears of his mind are in neutral, he hearkens his mind to particular verses in the Word of God. Because when your gears of your mind are in neutral, they are on yourself. Amen. Sorry. They are on yourself. Amen. I didn't say, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. You are all, we are all very, 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 very good at loving ourselves. And to carry that even further, a lot of times we find counselors and people around us that we text and call who will encourage us to love. Ourself. And if you say you're not supposed to love yourself, the world, the society, and the culture tells you no. You're supposed to love yourself and protect yourself and to take care of yourself and to be careful and to, you know, all, all the, look at any of the ads on, I don't know about the ads on TV now, they're promoting a whole other agenda, but adv advertisers appeal to our fear. So what was I saying? Here's the essence to me. The essence of worship is in verse 2 and 3, but 2, that I, that we, what's it say? We may live before him. That we may live before him. I absolutely love that verse. Here we see the essence of worship. Here we see the essence of what it means to know God. Okay? And having been brought up in the church, and having been brought up in mainline denominations, I, I've said before, you know, I went to a church, and I went to worship, and I went through the rituals, but I didn't know him, but I went through the worship, I went through the rituals, and I went through it, but did not know him. And I used to get handed the, the order, I don't know, hopefully ours doesn't say that, where's my bulletin? It doesn't say it, we gotta change it. No, okay, thank you, it doesn't say that. Well, my bulletin, when I used to go to church, said, order for worship. You do these things and then you worship, and that was an hour to 45 minutes was even better, and you go worship and you're gone. You're done. And of course, we know that's not the essence of worship. We'll get to the importance of our well, why we come together, but again, we come together for worship out of the overflow of our relationship with the Lord. And that's what God's people do on the Sabbath. They love the Lord, they've been with the Lord throughout the week, then we come together to encourage and exhort one another on in the faith. And I like to say, our mentality is wild horses could not drive us away from this time together, because it's special to us. We carve it out, we set it apart, and we say, this is, there's nowhere else where we would rather be, right? So he says here that we may live before him to live in his presence. And I said all that, but it's every day of our lives living in our presence. This is the easy part to me. This is the easy part to me. To come together on Sunday morning, 
to quote worship God. This is easy. This is you know, we can just go do this almost mechanically. Sometimes we we did or we could just do it. The harder part is living in His presence every moment, every day, in the home, in the house, with the kids, with your boss, with your siblings, with whomever you're in. Unless you're by yourself, then you still got your mind that you got to struggle with. But living in His presence is worship. Reacting to the world around us is living in His presence. That's worship. This is application. Just our reaction. Three verses that I've been trying to ingrain in my mind to help me to live in His presence. One is Philippians 1.27. So conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's worship. Conduct yourself. Lord, help me to conduct myself throughout my day in a manner worthy of the Lord. I know that I'm not doing it perfectly. Thank the Lord would not gain greater than any kind of curve. Thankfully, I don't have to get to 70% even to be okay in that area. Conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. Let your spirit bear witness with my spirit today, Lord, that I belong to you and how I react. Another verse that helps us to live, is you, you plug these in yourself, in your area of uh, trial, tribulation, or struggle. But another one for me is, is in 1 Peter 2. When you live with a bunch of revilers, not the worst. When you live with a bunch of revilers and mockers in your home, or in your workplace, or in your school, or wherever you are, and you want to live in His presence, and you want your life to be an acceptable act of worship and sacrifice to God, you take, and when the gears of your mind are in neutral, the, the reviling and the difficulty comes, you go to 1 Peter 2, where it says, your Lord, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. That helps someone like me who wants to strike back, and still does, want to strike back and revile in return or defend myself or let my displeasure be. I can let my displeasure, I don't need to say anything. See my face, my posture. I can let my disdain, my frustration, and the fact that the idol that I worship is me is being revealed right now. And I and, and, and sometimes I like enjoy doing it. That's how wicked and heinous it is. Do not revile when you are reviled. There's a third one that I'm thinking of, but I can't think of it. Um, right now. But this is how you live. Lord, help us to have an awareness of our need to return to the Lord. This is not like, you know, this is like returning to the Lord daily, moment by moment. And when we get into the practice of that and get into the habit of that, that's getting into the habit of not doing as much the very thing we hate. That's in a way of moving I don't even put my finger on it. That's a way of moving away from that uh, to walking in the Spirit and not satisfying or gratifying the desires of the flesh. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, is a great encouragement there of living in His presence. Acts 3, 19. Therefore, repent. That's how we live in His presence and return so that your sins may be wiped away. And here's what happens when we repent, when we turn, when we have an awareness of our need to return and we repent and we return in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The essence of worship. Genuine love for God has that awareness of our need to return to the Lord in repentance. And then times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord and that's like worship of our God. Alright, so because genuine love for the one true God and we know we can't get all that 100%, we got the world, the flesh and the devil to contend with but we're moving, we're striving, this is our desire, this is our heart's goal. Genuine love for the one true God is the essence of worship. So we need an appetite what it says in Hosea, it says throughout Scripture, an appetite to acknowledge the Lord, to know the Lord. 
Hosea 6.3 would be another memory verse. Hosea 6.3 would be another meditation verse. And this principle is seen in other places in Scripture. The essence of worship, living in His presence, the essence of worship. Let us know. Love it. We can walk not knowing. Let us know. See, I'm twiddling my thumbs. Does anybody do this anymore? Twiddle their thumbs. No. Let us know is not a passive endeavor. Okay. Let us know is not just let go and let God even. I used to hear that one. Let us know is not passive. Because if we're passive, we're never passive. Even when we're think thinking, we're not necessarily passive. But if we're passive, and not aggressively pressing on to know the Lord, then every other thing in the world is going to get in our way, and everything in the world, flesh the devil, is going to deter us. It's going to, very easily, unless you set in your mind, this is how I'm going to handle myself, and this is how I'm going to conduct myself in this area, in that area, I'm going to strive to conduct myself in that manner. That way I know that when I do stray, oh, okay, i got an awareness I need to return to the Lord in that area. It's not a passive existence. Let us know. Let us press on, I love it, to know the Lord. Press on. It means being zealous to know the Lord. And we got all these illustrations. We know when we're zealous for our hobby. We know when we're zealous for our whatever. We're zealous, listen, we know this. Okay, we're zealous for what gives us pleasure. We just are. That's why all of life is worship. And I said it's what we give, what we have pleasure for is what we worship. And we're not saying it's not okay. It's okay. It's not. We're not saying you can't have a hobby. We're not saying you can do it. You can't have these other things. We're saying the love of these things is what the idol is. The love of money, not money. The love of money is the root of evil. So to press on to know the Lord, this is, this is to appreciate Him. This is to um, <coughs> cherish the Lord. Those things that you love, those things that you cherish, those things that you hold precious and dear to you are what you go after and what you pursue, and they in themselves can become idols. Right? So what does pressing on to know and cherish the Lord look like in our lives? Well, like I said, it's not passive. It's, 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 it's being awake. It's, it's being alert. It's, it's, uh, it's a striving and it's a moving forward. It's a, it's a confession and it's a repentance. It's, it's, a, it's an awareness of our need to return to the Lord in those areas where we need to return. It's a living with a God consciousness. It's a, it's, a, it's a literally praying without ceasing mindset. And again, please, it's, don't, if you want to, if, if I want to sit here and we want to sit here and think this is all too undaunting, this is too undaunting, I, I can't do that. Then you're focused right there in that thought, because I just have the thought. The focus right there in your thought is not in your God. Your focus and your thought, our focus is on us. And we are limited. Yes, but come, come to me. Repent. Times of refreshing may come to you from the presence of the Lord. Now you know him. One day you're going to know him fully, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13, too. Then you won't have to deal with all this stuff. When you know him fully as you are fully known, there's no more world, there's no more flesh, there's no more devil. But in some ways, it's more special now for us this side of heaven. You read, I, I, think I, I, I think I put it back in at the end, verses in Revelation when we close about worship, 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 or worship, or praise, or adore, or throwing crowns. There it will just be, we'll just be so, there'll be no world, flesh, devil, there'll be no sin. We'll just be so enamored with the Lord that we'll just be worshiping and praising Him and serving Him forever. Now it's challenge. Now, in some way, that is, it's pleasing to him then, or it's pleasing to him now. Why do you think he says, well done, 
good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So it's not passive, that's all I'm saying. And it's, it's to be aggressively, intentionally pressing on to know him. Or you could Twitter your life away. What a great name for Twitter. It's a perfect name for what has evolved with Twittering. It's like, literally, it's Twittering your thumbs. Literally, actually, that is what it is. It's doing this. <laughs> Mindless. You don't, you don't, and then you go to the doctor, and they got that, the, the music playing, just keep, keep you distracted, and you just Twitter your way away, or you Facebook your life away, and see how much friends that you can get. I'm not saying there's not a place to Twitter. Maybe there is. There's not a place to Facebook. I'm not saying that. All right. So aggressive. So if you remember, pressing on to know him. You got that one? You got that one? You got that illustration? Pressing on to know him is the way that the Christian is encouraged and challenged to live. And you can live that way. You can. We can. As we're growing in our relationship with the Lord and as we're growing in our appreciation for what he's done for us. That's why these articles and the doctrine are so precious to us. Because it reminds us of what he's done for us and who we are in the light of his glorious presence. And it's what drives us to press on to know him. But the, but the, flip, but the flip side of that is coming up in verse 4, pressing on to know him versus your loyalty is like a morning cloud when you get there. But his going forth is as certain as the dawn. He'll come to us. He'll come to us when we go to know him, like rain, like the spring water, watering the earth. God will come to his repentant people. So what effect does knowing the Lord have upon you? Again, it's that Paul said it, but I press on to know him in the power of his resurrection. You know what that means? I press on to know him, that the power of his resurrection may be seen in how I live, move, and have my being. May be seen in my conducting myself in a manner worthy of the gospel. May be seen when I'm reviled to not revile in return. And I can't remember what the third one is, but I can't right now. There's more than three, it's countless. And then, what does pressing on to know him look like? It looks like this, too. You've just, I don't really care how many years we've walked with the Lord, we've just in a sense, compared to eternity, have begun to taste the kindness and goodness of the Lord. And so what effect does the just the taste of him have? First Peter 2, 1. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, newborn babes, Long for pure milk of the word. Then you're born baby, you know, the illustration you get. Longing for the mother's milk. Put it in the mother's lap, next to the mother's breast. I had that happen to me one time with one of the little kids that I was holding and they wanted milk. And I'm like, on me. <laughs> So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We grow through the word of God. And the degree to which you and I read our Bible. And the degree to which you and I are in active pursuit of the Lord. And the degree to which you and I are pressing on to know him is dependent upon. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, the appetite goes up, not down. And you're never fully satisfied. You desire and hunger more. And the Twitter and the whatever and the self and the reviling and return and the not conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, or whatever it is that we're called to do as we're seeking to follow him, that desire and taste and affection overrides the other. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And pressing on to know the Lord looks like 2 Peter 3, 12, 18. But grow, but grow the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, we're honing in on genuine what genuine worship is. It has to come from genuine love for the Lord, being the essence of worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because of that, we see in verse 4 an admonition for us toward faithfulness to the Lord. 
He's saying this to his wayward people there, the Israelites. What shall I do with you, Ephraim? Can you hear him saying that to you sometime? What am I going to do with you, John? What am I going to do with you? Put your name in there. What, what am I going to do with you? What am I going to do with you, Martha? Martha, you're so worried and perplexed and concerned about so many other things, and it's like the one thing that is most needful you're forsaking. What shall I do with you, Judah? And then he, the opposite of pressing on to know him, you see, he describes their loyalty to that to, to him. Your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. This is why we got this, we need this admonition in our mind to faithfulness to the Lord. This is why this corporate assembly, this a Bible study corporate assembly, a one-on-one -on -one discipleship corporate assembly, a coming together for prayer is a corporate assembly. And we need to encourage each other in these areas of pressing on to know Him. That's why this corporate life is, is important. Because He says, your loyalty is like a morning cloud. You, ever, you, you, know, you, could, be reading, you could be reading the Bible. You could be praying. And even in the midst of that, some outside force comes in and interrupts your being, and it's like, then you're like James, and you become a James, what's the verse? Out of the same mouth? What? Out of the same mouth comes praise and worship and adoration for the Lord, and out of the same mouth, because it's in the heart, out of the same mouth comes septic water, polluted water. I told you, I think, how I did that one time. This is where I get, I get diverted. But I was playing golf with my grandfather, Steve, and he was teaching me how to play golf. We went to Great Hill Golf Course in Seymour. It's not there anymore. And there was a pond. They had water throughout the course, fountains, and they had a soda machine. But on the eighth hole, there was a water hose. And so I went over to that water hose. And that was thirsty. It was like July. It was like hot. And I go over to that water hose, and I took a sip, and it was polluted water. Literally, it was water. I tasted it. If I did that now, I'd be like, oh boy, what did I drink? What's going to happen? It's like, I drank that stuff. And I'm burping it up the rest of that day. Out of the same mouth can come forth. Praises to God and pollution. All right. The history of the nation of Israel, their commitment to the Lord was superficial. The prophets continually call them to repentance. You got in the verses in Exodus 20, how the Lord your God is a jealous God. He says, your loyalty to me, your faithfulness to me at times is like a morning cloud. It's like the dew which goes away early. You know what that picture looks like in the morning. The dew's on the grass and it's gone. But we're here admonished to faithfulness to the Lord. And he says that in verse 6. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. That, that's the real kicker. You could go through all the motions of worship. You can go through, and it's, it's the heart that God is after. In fact, that other worship, I'll read a couple verses, that he don't like that other kind of worship. I delight in loyalty, faithfulness, obedience to me. Yeah, put that word out there. That's the essence of genuine worship of God. Obedience to the Lord. Rather than sacrifice of the knowledge of God, rather than word of you tithe, Jesus said, you tithe, good. You ought to have tithe. You ought to tithe, Pharisees. You ought to do that. But then you're disrupt. You're, you're, you're not caring for people. You're not caring for the orphans. You're not caring for the widow. And your heart is wrong. And you're throwing the money in you know, just to make a, a presentation. And at the same time, the want to just put a, less than a penny offered more of worship the Lord stronger than the ones that were. So, it goes both ways. Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, speaks of uh, this, uh, the type of worship that the Lord desires and the type of worship that the Lord hates. What shall I come to the Lord? With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves, 
Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? O Lord, I'm sorry, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, that would be love your neighbor as yourself. And to walk humbly with your God, that would be knowing God, pressing on to know him. You see that illustration in 1 Samuel 15, 21 through 23, where he's telling uh, uh, Saul about the sacrifices that he was offering and how he wasn't being obedient to the Lord in the offering of those sacrifices. In Amos chapter 5, verses 18, I'm sorry, verses 21 through 24, I desire loyalty. I desire obedience even rather than sacrifice. I hate it. I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings, your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fattens. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters in righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So because genuine for the love for the one true God is the essence of worship, Lord, help us to have an awareness of our need to return to you. Lord, give us an appetite to acknowledge and know you. And where we need admonishing, be admonished toward faithfulness to the Lord. So we've talked about this. These are all application. These are all application even as we go. I'm just going to leave you with one other one here. In light of this, let's repent. You've already said it. Let's repent where we need to repent. By returning to our first love. Revelation 2. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first, or else I am coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus and their Satan. And the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And Satan said to you, the Lord, all these things I give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan. He said, Go, get behind me, get away from me, put the gears of your mind into a good verse that will help you to live your life before him in worship and praise of him. Get behind me. Follow Jesus' example. Have the ability and the capacity in you to say to the devil and to your flesh, it is written, it is written, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your It is written, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. It is written, do not revile when you are reviled, but keep entrusting yourself to your heavenly Father is the, the latter part of that verse. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. So where there's sin, there's a worship of something other than the Lord. Where there's sin, there's worship of self. You boil it all down to it. So how's God inviting us to respond to the essence of worship? Repent. Times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. John chapter 4. Great, great verse on this. The woman at the Samaritan well. She said, Women, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, Samaritan woman, worship what you do not know. The essence of worship is to know Him. We worship what we know, Jesus said to her, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
And if you need any other encouragement, if we need any other admonition, if we need any other, okay, what, why? What's, what, why should we strive to do this? Why should we seek to live our life as an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord? It says, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. He seeks to be worshipped. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. i got to throw in there that our lives as a lived of a living sacrifice are acts of worship to the Lord. Prayer is an acceptable sacrifice of worship and praise to the Lord. Our serving the Lord in whatever area or measure of capacity we are serving the Lord in is an act of worship to the Lord. Our giving someone a cup of cold water, a ride, a phone call, an encouragement is an act of worship to the Lord. Can I say our giving is an act of worship to the Lord. Revelation 4, 9 through 11. Here's the crescendo of worship and praise of God that occurs after the life has been lived, seeking to know Him and to grow in Christ and to worship and praise Him and to live and move and have our being in His presence. To live in His presence. Here's the ultimate living in His presence. Revelation 4, 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Then they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things for your glory. I had that part. And by your will they were created. And have their being. Revelation 5, 9 through 14. And they sang a new song. And we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to sing a new song. We can sing a new song each and every day as we live in his presence and strive to know him and return to him in repentance and faith. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. That's 1 Peter 2. Our lives are offered as living sacrifices to God or accept the act of worship. You've made them to be kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand and ten thousands, and they circled the throne, the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, you know what they say. Worthy is the land who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That's the essence of worship. Worthy are you to receive these things, Lord. Worthy are you now to receive these things for me as I seek to live this side of heaven. And the Lord, and I heard a very heavy creature in heaven and on earth, under the heaven, under the earth, and on the sea, and all that's in them, singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. In Matthew 19, 6 through 10, I heard the sound like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing, rushing waters, and like the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. For fine, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are these who are invited. To... You're invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, church. You're invited to enjoy the fellowship of the Lord now, this side of heaven, church. People, you're invited. Come. He says, these are the true words. And what did he do at this feet? At this, I fell to my feet to worship him. But he said, don't do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the quote for the week. George Whitfield said, you could say, here's a definition of worship. 
Study to know him more and more. For the more you know, the more you will love him. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And all God's people said, hallelujah, praise the Lord, may it be so. Mm -hmm. At 12.35, it's not 12.35 yet, but whatever time we walk out that door, may it be so that we're worshiping the Lord out there. And then may it be so. Wild horse is not able to drag us away from being here together on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever time someone says, hey, let's get together and have fellowship together. Wild horses could not drag us away. We know it's what the Lord wants and we know what's good for our soul. Amen.